This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. A developing area of research led through participatory research. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> thanks for that wonderful introduction and thanks for having me today. We're on the, uh, the last lap or the last leg. <laughs> um, uh, and as was said, uh, my paper is titled Ballroom Blitz Military Uniform with Fashion and Vintage Events. And I titled it that because of the ballroom reference, but I also like alliteration. So, uh, first and foremost, an apology to any fans of Sweet. This is not about 1970s glam rock in the UK. Um, I am talking about a number of 1940s and 1950s <coughs> vintage and revival events that take place in the UK. And in particular, uh, my interest is in those where music and dancing, which relate to the period, um, are a central part of these occasions. Um, more so, I guess, my focus is on attendees and participants at these events and those who dress as members of the armed forces. So, Army, Navy or Air Fo Force, um, and you'd principally see them, obviously, dressed as those members uh, from the UK or the US. Um, I'm intrigued and interested in their motivations for dressing in this way, but also very much the um, attitudes and the responses and the perceptions of the other attendees, those who are not in uniform, to this particular form of dress and how well this, uh, these sartorial choices are seen as appropriate um, and the degree to which they are read, understood and considered within these circumstances. Um, so my motivation for this particular study has come from my own participa participation and attendance at some of these events. Uh, I consider myself part of what is often very generically referred to as a vintage scene in London. And so uh, this would inform the clothes that I wear, the music I like to listen to, the dances that I do, amongst other things. Um, and at many of these nights out and these weekend events that I go to, um, it's very striking to see the mixture of signs that's on offer within these spaces. Uh, the scope of the music, the dancing, the clothes, all of these elements cover decades of references. Um, and some of the common elements of these occasions is the wearing of military uniform, or perhaps very importantly in many cases, a approximation of a military uniform. Um, so while, to a certain extent, I identify myself as an insider, if you like, or a participant in this particular scene, I also come to it as an outsider in many ways. So you may have recognised by my accent, um, I'm an Irish person living in Britain. And so while I have a kind of strong familiarity with a lot of British culture um, and British history, for me, the significance and the centrality of the armed forces doesn't have this same immediate personal connection or this degree of wide historical and cultural significance as it does for so many people here in Britain. <coughs> and so I was and I am <coughs> intrigued by the way that uniform is portrayed, the um, way it is played out in these situations, and the attitudes and responses of other attendees. And so through my paper, I'll be considering some of the meanings and references that are connected to these events. Um, I will be drawing on some primary research I've undertaken. Um, as was said, I'm a participant observer. And uh, over the last few years, I've undertaken a number of semi-structured and unstructured interviews with other participants and aspects of those conversations will contribute to this discussion. Um, but also, I'd like to 
consider and try and situate some of these examples and some of these ideas that I'm talking about uh, relative to wider ideas of subcultural capital, authenticity and nostalgia. And already today, obviously, we've had a number of citations of authenticity as central to um, some of the elements that are being discussed. So across the UK annual annually, there are a range of events for which the period of the Second World War is the focus, or the period of the Second World War is within the sweep of time that is addressed um, on these occasions. A large number of these events are very specifically reenactment events. So, for example, um, the Yorkshire wartime experience uh, or the victory show in Leicester. And so, these do obviously um, overlap uh, in temporal terms the area that I'm looking at, but as they are specifically reenactment and as such have their own set of expectations and their own set of conventions, um, the attitudes, the set of behaviours, the activities, the expectations and conceptions of authenticity are not the same as those that I would like to talk about. Um, a lot of these ideas can be addressed in relation to um, wider uh, analysis um, of cultural heritage and things like dark tourism and things like that. So that's separate from what I'm looking at. So instead, and specifically, 1940s and 1950s vintage, revival and party events where military uniforms may be in evidence, but the idea of a concerted military reenactment element or the idea of conflict is not the focus. Um, and so I've chosen a few examples. Um, and these are marketed variously as, for example, um, music and dance festival at Twinwood. Um, and so you see the opportunity to go glamping for the weekend um, with their sprung dance floors, indoors and outdoors, and avail of their dance lessons. Um, and you can see um, through the literature, it takes place over a four day weekend. Um, and uh, some of the participants, in this case, people engaging with um, military uniform. There's an event uh, such as um, this opportunity to turn, this is a quotation from their website, turn back the clock to the decade of fashion, commemoration, style and celebration at our annual 1940s relived event. And that's at the Brooklyn's Museum. There are also weekend long events or weekenders as we tend to refer to them in the vernacular. So things like the Hepcats holiday which is a biannual weekend, quote, festival of music, dancing and shopping, covering music from the 1930s to the early 1950s, or two incredible days packed with 1950s rock and roll music, dancing, superb vintage stalls, street food served from vintage vans, and non-stop fun, action and mid-century style at the Atomic Festival, which is one of the newer festivals, I think it's in its third year this year. Um, the opportunity to spend three days and nights immersed in another world at the Rhythm Riot. Um, and the Rhythm Riot is in its 20th year this year, um, and it takes place down in Pontons in Canberra Sands every November. Um, and again, Pontons, like Butlins, these kind of bastions of post-war British um, seaside uh, luxury, in many cases, <laughs> some of the chalets are labeled to luxury, uh, and on a windy November day, it certainly feels like that. Um, and then in addition to events like these, these are, there are some one-off kind of uh, party events, um, such as the Blitz Party, which is one of the, the most significant in London. Um, and this is uh, marketed as a night to, quote, recreate the glamour of 1940s London. So across these events, Music and dancing are very much to the fore, and there are an array of DJs and live music as part of the entertainment. By virtue of the span of time addressed, music typically crosses from the 1930s to the 1950s, but sometimes a little bit outside of that. And you can see people dancing to a range of dances and styles, including swing, lindy hop, jive, the stroll, bopping, the shag, balboa, and the charleston. And I'm going to refrain from standing up to offer a demonstration <laughs> of any and all of those. We forgive me, please. Um, a central element of my thesis here is the proposition that much of what can be observed and engaged with at these occasions can be seen and read in relation to ideas of subculture. 
and drawing on this as a, as a starting point, I see subcultural capital and authenticity as two key areas. So clothing and style in any subcultural context are very significant in discussing authenticity and subcultural capital. As psychologist Gregory Stone states, people use dressing as a game in which to maximize the fit with one's peers and equally let spectators know what game they are playing. This particular game is about marking oneself as a member of a vintage scene. By virtue of the nature of these events, one cannot always speak of a single subculture, but instead we can see a mix, um, uh, sorry, an evidence of a mix of identifiers. There are people that might be considered part of a swing scene, dressed in the styles of the 1940s. Others might be more 1950s and adopt the clothes and styles of a rock and roll or rockabilly subculture. And then even within these particular groupings, there are different styles that define preference and taste. So from ladies in their 60s who wear poodle skirts and bobby socks, to 1970s Teds, to diehard 1950s vintage enthusiasts. Others still uh, address a range of references, conflating elements from different subcultures, or some people have no immediately identifiable subcultural references in terms of the clothing that you wear. They wear, you can see that here. According to academics Nikki Gregson, Kate Brooks, and Louise Crew, retro consumers mobilize the authentic as a means of demonstrating individuality, knowingness, knowledgeability, and discernment, and as an expression of their cultural capital, and as a way of constructing difference from others. Here, this difference is central to the identification both as a member of a particular subculture and, importantly, within that subculture as a means of determining your place. The idea of authenticity, though, is not straightforward. And within the sphere of the scene we are considering, there are differing, complementary, and conflicting ways of applying it. Essentially, perhaps, authenticity here is worked out and performed through, amongst other things, your clothes, your hairstyle, your style of dancing. The visual uh, identifiers of one's dress then serve to offer an immediate and very public connection with the group of which you are part. The choice of dress and the degree of accuracy in terms of the desired signified references and connotations demonstrates your knowledge and your taste. Writer and sociologist Sarah Thornton introduces the idea of subcultural capital as a characteristic of a subculture. Subcultural capital which draws on and develops Pierre Bourdieu's ideas of capital, can be objectified or embodied. In her example, um, it can be objectified through fashionable haircuts and well-assembled record collections, and embodied through being in the know. Both of these examples for Thornton are directed at the 1990s club culture but I would suggest can also be applied to the current 1940s or 1950s scenes, where your quiff or your pin curls, uh, Sun Record 7-inch or Shellac 78, or the car that you own can demonstrate some aspect of, or in many cases, a lack of, your knowledge. The idea of these correct decisions can also be applied to the choice of clothes and the style of dress. It is a performance of taste, knowingness, and discernment acted out for an audience of those in the know. In this context, the clothing develops the set of references which are central to this performance of taste, knowingness, and discernment. If we accept Diana Crane's idea that clothing as a form of communication has become a set of dialects rather than a universal language, I wish to address my examples as a set of dialects spoken in the same space and on the surface connected, but in fact speaking to a range of people in the conversation, not all of whom are saying or hearing the same things, identifying the same emphasis, or drawing the same conclusions. And the three pictures here are taken from a weekender that's called the Rockabilly Rave, and that takes place in June, uh, again in Pontins, and this year it's his 20th year. So although they are at a weekender which has the title Rockabilly Rave, there are these kind of subsections and sub-references. So we might read the gentleman on the right 
um, as kind of referencing more psychobilly, the kind of classic rocker on the left hand side, and obviously the Western references in the middle. So the kind of subtleties within these broader um, umbrella areas and subcultural ideas. Um, so returning to uniforms. Any uniform, of course, comes with it a set of expectations and conventions. There are a set of associations marked by the particular uniform and the context in which it is worn. Uniforms lead to expectations of the wearer's behaviour and social status. When uniforms are adopted by civilians as a costume for these contexts, this complicates and undermines the set of behaviours and the designation of status we might ordinarily associate with the uniform. And the mixing of uniform as costume and uniform as historical reference dilute these immediate and conventional associations and expectations further. As part of my research, I've spoken to a number of people at different events and addressed with them the idea of wearing a military uniform, how they viewed it both in general terms and in the context of the space we were in and the type of event that we were at. Uh, these are people that I would know socially, people I'd spend a lot of time with, on nights out and at weekenders. Um, and I spoke to them about the idea of choice of uniform as the dress for a night out and the way that the uniform was worn. Um, oftentimes I noted the responses after the fact, so rather than quoting and paraphrasing what they said. Um, one of the key findings from my surveys was the divide between people who saw wearing a uniform as a kind of tribute or an act of respect towards people who fought in the Second World War. Um, and then, on the other hand, a lot of people saw it as an attempt to kind of appropriate or adopt some idea of heroism, and it wasn't something that sat very well with them. Um, <clears throat> uh, late on Saturday night at a weekend or last November, I asked one of my acquaintances his reaction to the uniforms in the room. He told me that he himself has a strong interest in reenactment, and in the past he has worn uniforms when he was part of a uh, World War II reenactors group. He had dressed as a Second World War American GI. He explained that he had stopped when he felt he was too old to be credibly seen in this role, and he felt that it was a kind of inauthentic performance. Um, then he pointed around the room to a number of people in different versions of uniform. <coughs> his hair is too long, his stomach's hanging over his belt, his shirt is untucked. So for him, the issue was not necessarily with the uniform, but the lack of accuracy with how it was worn. He articulated what others had noted. A uniform is a sign that could be seen to enhance machismo and glamour. As that phrase goes, women and men love a man in uniform. And for some on the scene, as it was during the Second World War, the American uniform is seen as more attractive than the British. Others I've spoken to read the uniforms as something less appropriate, appropriate in these circumstances. It's seen by many as missing the point of these events. There is, as I've mentioned, this very significant outlet for reenactment and commemorative opportunities. And for many, these vintage events are seen as subcultural events for living subcultures rather than opportunities for reenactment of past events. The music, the dress, the dancing, etc., are aspects of a current and, importantly, a continuing subcultural engagement. Um, and they're seen as a welcome and central part of this. But for many, the military uniform ties the event to ideas and illusions that are both unexpected and unwelcome on a night or a weekend's entertainment. There is a sense for many that the introduction of uniform creates a weight of historical connection which, while obviously directly connected with this period, is not the function of these events. This militarization is seen by many as a parodic rather than a respectful act, or an overly light or cursory treatment of a very weighty subject. The adoption of approximations of uniforms, poorly presented uniforms, incomplete uniforms, sexed up uniforms, unearned rank or plastic medals, arguably render the choice of dress to be more closely tied to something like poor cosplay than subcultural participation as it might be expected to be. Uh, wearing a uniform and positioning oneself as identifiably or purportedly 1940s, 40s or 50s brings with it a wider set of expectations uh, in terms of behaviour. 
The uniform is not only an emblem, but also a reminder of the behavior appropriate towards this emblem. And as such, the less than perfect attention to detail and the manner in which <coughs> uniforms can seem to be worn, ill-fitting, incomplete, etc., undermines the expected appropriate behavior and, I would suggest, draws attention to the uniform as little more than fancy dress. In these terms, it calls into question the appropriateness of dressing this way, but it also reflects an attitude at odds with many of the other ten attendees. As has been described in other research on other vintage scenes, the choice of dress related to a particular period sets up a division, demarking the knowing from the carnivalesque modes of appreciation. And this, I think, is a central difference. There is a separation between the idea of subcultural participation here. This active engagement with the living subculture, although one that is so significantly connected with the past, and this appropriation of key identifiers of specific historical events in the past. Clothes worn are objects which serve memory. They constitute our picture of the past. And this connection or tension between past and present forms a central part of the differing readings of uniform as choice of dress. For many of the people at these events, the choice of dress is part of their day-to-day -day identity. The signifiers of the past, my shirt for example, um, are also seen to be part of their current identity and as such reject elements which try and tie them to a completed past rather than an active present which is influenced and to a certain degree guided by that past. In the introduction to his recent book, The Ministry of Nostalgia, writer and journalist Owen Hatherley finds himself in a vintage market by the Cutty Sark in London. It is the starting point for a very engaging polemical rampage about a utopian recasting of the past as a means of supporting and framing current government policies. The make, do and mend and the keep calm and carry on rhetoric that's being employed to co-opt consent for austerity and cuts. He is discomforted by the performance of the aesthetic of austerity and its historical syncretism. In this case, mixing the circumstances of post-war Britain and the emergence of the welfare state with current neoliberal policies and this move towards privatization. <coughs> It is this sense of discomfort that I feel reading the uniform as a nostalgic fancy dress for carnivalesque entertainment rather than serious historical reenactment. I have difficulty in reconciling the casual appropriation of military uniform as a costume for a night's dancing. The historical connections are obvious. The presence of uniform in the dance halls of the Second World War and the introduction of swing music in the Jitterbug form a significant part of the history of dancing in Britain. And as such, it is a related and very clearly related to the situation. The move towards an incomplete complete uniform or some approximation of a uniform looking ensemble becomes much <coughs> more tenuous and as such floats free of some of the identifiers we've noted. In terms of recreation, it fails. In terms of demonstrating expected subcultural considerations, it again largely fails. In terms of the desired connection, we might say it marks what might be referred to as vintageness or vintagicity, as Roland Barthes might have put it, some nebulous notion of some significant but ill-defined past. More benignly, perhaps, we can read these references as making use of dress as a cultural si signal of time and an important component of cultural memory, historic consciousness and imagery. Through this view, the adoption of uniform connects the wearer and the event to these historical circumstances this significant period of national pride and community. And if nothing else, it contributes to maintaining a tradition of partner social dancing that has been lost in many places to the sig significant regret of some. In these terms, I think this adoption of uniform as an identifier of connection is tied to a wider nostalgic view of history. Nostalgia is a strong presence. This idea, this imaginatively remembered past homeland or community informs much of the surface connection with the age. The past is made present in a simulacrum for our enjoyment. The more problematic aspects of the period, gender, race, class, sexuality among them, are largely swept aside in celebration of this halcyon past. Looking around the dance floor, we can see this complex knot of signs, these dialects of dress, and these complete, com competing knowledges. 
This tension plays out on this peacetime stage, where bopping replaces bombs and swing outs replace sirens, and the conflict is perhaps less of a blitz and something closer to a Cold War. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, up next, we have Roger Goodman. Yeah, Roger Goodman, who uh, is come, has come for, over from Georgia State University in the History Department, and his uh, paper is entitled Leading Men and Following Women, Image, Perception and Live Reality in Atlanta Ballroom Dance Studios, 1950 to 1990. Uh, Roger was born and raised in South Africa, where his parents met in a, at a ballroom studio, so his, his relationship is quite far back. Uh, he went to the US uh, in order to dance for Brian Young University Ballroom Dance Company, uh, where he received a BA and MA in History. He's currently a PhD candidate at Georgia State in Atlanta, um, looking in history also. Uh, his dissertation, Ballroom in the Big Peach, examines the changes and continuities in the ballroom dance studios in Atlanta in the second half of the 20th century. If you're ready, you go. A businessman sits with his feet on his desk talking on the telephone. He tells the person on the other end of the line that he is taking a refresher course at the Fred Brooks Dance Studio. Maybe. Quote, I want the sure way to get... Oh, well, we gotta go back. This is jumping. No romance yet. There's a whole slide missing. Such things happen. Oh, I know. See, this is the third, that's the third slide. <laughs> oh, oh. All right, well, you're going to have to imagine it, apparently. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I want the sure way to get fun out of dance music and to be sure I'm going to lead my partner in a sophisticated, masculine manner, unquote. A couple in evening gown and tail suit dance suavely. The lady appears to almost swoon in the man's arm. He appears strong, capable, and of course handsome. Text next to the image proclaims that, quote, ladies are taught to dance with the tread of a queen, the men with masculine confidence that all admire, unquote. In another image, a beautiful woman stares up at the handsome man, their faces inches apart. She tilts her chin up toward him, expectant. He looks calm and secure as he holds her in a ballroom dance hold. Above the sensuous scene is the bolded statement, if it'll come now, maybe, oh, there it is, don't let romance pass you by and a cartoon heart dripping tears from its eyes. <laughs> Arthur Murray, the ad tells the reader, can make you fun and popular by teaching you to dance. <laughs> These are three of thousands of adverts yeah. that ran daily in the Atlantic <coughs> Constitution from the 1940s through the 1980s. Ballroom dance studios in the USA in this period sold the public an image of the male in a ballroom dance partnership being the leader and the female being the follower. Advertising for ballroom dance studios in the US perpetuated this image through both pictures and text. Perhaps inadvertently, the implication was that men were in charge on the floor and women were at their beck and call. The image of women as passive followers in a dance partnership has been an enduring public perception of how ballroom dancing functions. Even today, popular television programs relating to ballroom dance in the U.S., including uh, Dancing with the Stars and So You Think You Can Dance, I haven't seen Come Dancing for many years, so I can not say here, but uses the same trope to sell their product. Women continue to be portrayed as the submissive receivers of men's lead. They graciously follow what the men direct them to do. I think I keep hitting the wrong button. And of course, one of my favorite movies, Strictly Ballroom. Where the man goes, the lady must follow, right? Um, in a case study of ballroom dance studios in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States, between 1950 and 1990, however, it is apparent that women both used this image to their advantage in selling ballroom dance to consumers and defied it as they carved out a vital space for themselves in Atlanta studios. They transcended the social boundaries relating to the role of women in the workforce and publicly maintained those boundaries as a means of enticing clients. Off the dance floor, female teachers assumed positions of power and prominence as studio owners and managers. They also established themselves as influential players in the ballroom dance industry on the dance floor. This paper examines the contradictions and dimensionalities of the image of ballroom dance in Atlanta and the U.S. as perpetuated in newspaper and corporate advertising and the lived reality of those who participated in the Atlanta ballroom dance culture. Who in reality was leading and who was following? So, as Kirsty mentioned, this, uh, this paper is actually part of, a small part of, my dissertation, a larger project um, that talks 
Anyway, that looks at our land studio and find that rather than Southern exceptionalism, if you know that about the US, the South is exceptional, not really. Um, <laughs> this, that's what I'm arguing. The story of organized ballroom <laughs> dance in Atlanta since 1948 mirrors the changes in studio practices and functions nationally, all right? Uh, with the same issues of race, class, and gender. That's what I look at mainly, right? Studios in Atlanta advertised in the local daily, the Atlanta Constitution. In almost every advertisement in the 1950s and many in the 1960s, there's a picture of a couple dressed in formal evening wear, looking as though they are elated to be dancing. In each picture, the man dominates. In a 1951 ad for the Atlanta Arthur Murray Studio, let's see if it comes up. Oh, only some have decided to come up. Oh, 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 you can, there we go, maybe, there we go. Um, female elation in being held uh, by the charming, tall, dark, and handsome male is clear. The ad offers the reader the chance to be the most envied couple in your set. In an advert for the Fred Brooks studio, hopefully, uh, no, it's a lie. Uh, the man is broad-shouldered, and the viewer sees his face full on. His partner's face is in profile, and appears to be experiencing, again, great enjoyment in the arms of her partner. The banner over the top of the ad proclaims that social and business success demand social skills. In the 1950s United States, business success was the purview of men. Social success included the expectation of marriage. Having a wife to dance with at social engagements was an indication of reaching social success. Being a good dancer was an indication of good breeding and manners as well. Um, a 1964 Atlanta Constitutional article asked the question, does dancing improve manners? Local teachers and parents resoundingly agreed that Ballroom Dance teaches good manners and lamented that society was not teaching children those manners at home and school. Charles Reagan Wilson has written that Southerners have traditionally equated manners, or the appropriate customary way of, proper way of doing things, with morals, so that unmannerly behavior has been viewed as immoral behavior. An appeal to propriety and social skills would therefore have a ring of familiarity to Southerners. Part of the Southern ideals of manners was the cult of chivalry, women being treated with absolute courtesy. Thus, ballroom dancing was, with the man's part, delineated from the woman's part, perhaps at a particular appeal to elite Southerners, the group who attempted to protect and uphold this image. Significantly, all the dance teachers quoted in the, the Atlanta Constitution article were women, right? Um, these two women who were real staples of the ballroom community. In an Arthur Murray, oh, this is the one that came up earlier, it was here a second ago. Space Oh, now it skipped like way back. All right, we'll pretend this is great. I wonder if I go out of it here. Oh, look, there are all the pictures that actually we're missing. All righty. I love technology. All right. There we go. Um, in an Arthur Murray corporate publication from the 50s or 60s, yes, it's a photocopy. It's a, a digitized version of a photocopy, so it's terrible, I know, right? Um, but these are taken at a studio in Atlanta by the corporation, and they served as a model for publicity campaigns that other studios in the change were encouraged to follow. In nearly every photo, the men in the photo are focal. Women's faces are seen in profile or not at all, while the men are smiling in full face. What are we to make of this? Perhaps <coughs> the studios were attempting to attract men by showing how much fun they could have. Showing them in a dominant position enjoying themselves would certainly be an image that would appeal to male breadwinners in the 1950s. Perhaps it might have appealed to women because it indicated that they were actually men to dance with at the studio. Ballroom studios have consistently had uh, more female clientele than ma male. Whatever the interpretation, uh, the focus of the publicity pictures are the men. Studios also use the idea of the virtuous woman, and they need to guard her emotions and virtues to sell their uh, services. A prime example of this is found in a promotional pamphlet entitled, Won't You Dance With Me? Originally published as an article, it tells the story of a woman who desires to dance, but her husband will not learn. The author states that the wife, quote, if she is the patient-tolerant type, will in all probability bear it, unquote. But he warns that if the husband continues to refuse to dance, the wife will go out dancing, fall in love with someone else, and ultimately she may even decide upon a divorce. All because the man refused to learn to dance. The message, protect your wife from strain by learning to dance. Women need your protection, and manly men who dance could protect them. Oh, uh, yeah, that's helpful. I just added it. And that was live, will that? All right. Um, adverts throughout the 50s and 60s generally used an image of a couple dancing and text encouraging the reader to call or come into the studio to take a lesson. The strong man slash elated woman dichotomy continued to be used. 
While Othmar's studio advertising changed its focus in the 1970s to herald what they called the return of touch dancing, the messages were still often gendered. Othmar sent franchisees executive planners annually during the 1970s and 80s. These planners were calendars with suggestions for good advertising and business practices. The main 1978 sample ad shows a picture of... There it is, this one over here. Uh, Pancho Gonzalez, holding an Othmari dance trophy while wearing his tennis whites. His Othmari instructor is draped on him. In his second photo, the two are in traditional ballroom hold, dancing in the same clothing as the tennis picture. Part of the text reads, if you find yourself in opposing courts too often, get closer. Dancing together moves a lot more than your feet. Gonzalez is identified as the resident tennis pro at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas and the, quote, little lady, unquote, as an Othamari teacher. Despite the fact that Othamari Corporation banned teacher-client relationships beyond teaching in the studio, the ad gives the impression that these two are a couple. A man's masculinity, the, answer, the ad suggests, can be enhanced by learning to dance, and you too can have an instructor drape herself on you. <laughs> Most ballroom ads in the 1980s use graphics that are in some way generic and indicative of the disco era. Some adverts can still be interpreted as inferring the ideal of a dominant male. This uh, 1983 advert depicts a man holding a lady in what is called a cuddle position. While the position is relatively common in ballroom dance, the photograph depicts a woman happily wrapped in her own arms, which are controlled by her partner's hands. A common theme of the Murray Corporation used in the 70s and 80s was that learning to dance in a Murray studio could lead to romance. Often the implication was that married couples could connect through ballroom dance, but that was not always made explicit. An AJC Atlanta Journal, or Atlanta Constitution, I gotta make sure I get the right one, uh, and offered a winter warm up uh, and proclaimed that ballroom teachers could, quote, teach you how to touch your partner, move as one, unquote. Just who that partner would be was not defined. Another ad campaign declared that Othamari changes people into couples. The graphic of the advert depicts a woman with her hands placed behind her head, staring at the camera as her partner has his hand on her waist and is looking downward. The message the picture sends is a sexualized one. Obviously the man is enjoying this sensual moment, but the woman appears to be willing and in some ways dominant. Here is the more liberated woman. She is making the choice to be objectified, but she is being objectified. While not all advertising in the years between 1950 and 1990 portrayed women as the lesser sex, the idea that men were dominant in ballroom dance and women passive followers was perpetuated by studio advertising in Atlanta uh, for most of the 20th century. In sheer numbers, female teachers dominated the listings of ballroom teachers for the 1950s. Individual women continued to be prominent in the industry throughout the next three decades. Perhaps the dawn of ballroom dance in Atlanta was Margaret Bryan. That's her picture right there, the top one. Bryan was Arthur Murray's assistant at his original studio in Atlanta. Arthur Murray started his career in Atlanta. Uh, and then she opened her own studio. Bryan's name peppers the social columns of the AJC, the Atlanta Constitution, from the 20s to the 60s as she hosted parties and especially in regards to teaching high school students to dance. From the 20s to 1958, Bryan took a special interest in teaching youth both dancing and etiquette. She taught thousands of high school students in Atlanta each year through the courses she taught at schools in preparation for formal dances, as well as hundreds who attended her dance school for weekly training. These were children of upper middle class and elite families. Underscoring her significance in Atlanta's ball ministry, Brian was named Atlanta's Businesswoman of the Year in 1950. The article cites her work with more than 20,000 students in Atlanta and calls her a dancing teacher and etiquette arbiter. She was a public figure who openly displayed her expertise and business acumen. The article also points out another fascinating aspect of Brian's business. In the highly segregated Atlanta of the 1920s through 50s, it is interesting that Brian had a black business manager, quote, a faithful Negro named Selma, who has worked with her from the start of her school, unquote. Aside from the patronizing, patronizing tone of the reference and the first name only identification, the fact that Selma is given recognition at all is significant. Black Americans are absent from organized bold and dance writings relating to the 20s through 50s. This passing mention of Selma indicates that black Americans had, Americans had some kind of connection to ballroom dance in Atlanta. It's highly unlikely that the business manager played any front of house role in the studio, but that she worked at an Othamari studio in those decades in any capacity is noteworthy because of the segregated social circumstances of the U.S. South in the mid-20th century. Interviews with teachers who taught in the 50s and 60s indicate that the use and employment of gender stereotypes was a tactical, thought-out strategy used to benefit the studio. Don Wallace answered a 1958 Atlanta Constitution classified ad for Baldwin Dance instructors, no experience necessary. 
During the training class, it was continually emphasized that dancing was about making a woman happy by making her feel like a queen. Men, he was told, were in charge on the dance floor. Women were the target demographics for sales. This is typical rhetoric for the 1950s and 60s studio. But what makes this particularly interesting is that Wallace's training was conducted by a female teacher. This woman encouraged Wallace to think of women as the means to increasing his sales and that they should be treated as royalty, but also liked to have a strong man take control and direct them around the dance floor. And in addition, an additional dimension, she directed that married older women had their husband's money to spend. If the woman was a widow, the studio stood to gain even further, as it could become the primary social institution in her life, and thus she would channel her money to the studio. While today one might think of this as predatory, it might also be considered effective business sense. Now, here was a woman articulating a highly gendered image. She was one of the managers of the studio. From Wallace's interview, I interviewed him, this was not a woman who needed a man to take care of her on the dance floor, despite what she believed her female clientele needed. She was a powerful, influential woman in the Atlanta ballroom community. This undermines the idea of a male-dominated ballroom community, which exists in most of Baltimore. The image found is further when one considers that the owner of the Arthur Murray franchise in Atlanta from the 50s to the late 60s was a woman, Paige Thornton. Despite co-owning the studio with her husband, those narrators who worked in the Thornton studios who I interviewed all talked about Paige as the dominant stakeholder. Thornton controlled who could operate a studio under the Murray moniker. People came to her to buy into the Murray image. When the Thorntons decided to retire, they sold the Murray franchise rights to Jackie Walls. Walls had been the business manager to the Thorntons. She owned this and ran the studio, her own studio, actually in Atlanta for 35 years. She was known as a no-nonsense, by-the-book woman. Individuals who worked for her recall her as a consummate professional who was hardworking and tough. Walls was a closer, which in ballroom dance terms means she finalized contracts with clients. In the 60s and 70s, studios sold large contracts to clients, some over $20,000. Walls took clients into her office and strongly encouraged them to buy the contract. <coughs> One former client of Walls recalls her using high-pressure tactics to close sales. Even so, her students and clients loved her. As one client put it, quote, this is a woman speaking, there was something about Jackie that you liked, no matter how. You know, she'd take you in that back room and put the screws to you, and you'd end up signing all this, and then she'd go, now, honey, we'll work it all out. This is okay. And she just knew how exactly to deal, so that you did not dislike her. You'd like her anyway, unquote. Now, some clients believe Walls was dishonest in double-selling contract hours that clients hadn't used. This practice involved selling unused contract hours of clients who had indicated they would not return to the studio. Those hours were sold at discounted rates to favored clients. The studio essentially got paid twice for those hours. Was this shrewd business practice or an ethical double-dipping? Walls also did not tolerate teachers who broke protocol either. Teachers were not allowed to fraternize with clients outside the studio and its activities. Relationships between teachers were also theoretically restricted. Walls, however, used two male managers to do her dirty work for her. When teachers were fired for breaking rules, it was Bobby Richardson or Terry King who did the firing, not Walls. They played the bad guy to Walls' good guy. Ironically, Walls married King at one point as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, Phyllis Deneuve started teaching at a, a Fred Astaire in Atlanta, a Fred Astaire studio in Atlanta, in 1972. <coughs> Within six months, she was in a management position and remained in management and ownership for the rest of her career, which ended when she retired last year, 2015. At one point in the late 70s, Johnny Long, the Fred Astaire franchisee in Atlanta, sent Deneuve to manage the Marietta location. The studio had been damaged by fire and had suffered as a result. Within a year, the studio was running out of profit. Deneuve cites hard work and adherence to protocols as the reasons for her success. Deneuve stands out in the industry not only for her success, but because she defied conventional expectations. <laughs> Unlike most female teachers in the industry in the 70s, Deneuve not only married and remained in the ballroom industry, but she decided to have children. When she was halfway through her first pregnancy, the then director of Fred Astaire in Atlanta, Lee Miller, fired her. Quote, they thought I was useless because I was pregnant, unquote, says Deneuve. About a year later, however, Miller called her and asked her to return to the studio to manage a struggling studio, one of those struggling studios in Atlanta. She agreed. Four years later, she again left the industry, this time for two and a half years to have and raise her second son. She again returned to Fred Astaire to fix a studio that was failing. Within five years of returning, however, she left the corporation and opened an independent studio. She was the first Fred Astaire instructor in Atlanta to leave the franchise and open her own studio. She ran her own studio for more than 20 years. In an industry that became increasingly dominated by male owners and managers, the NEV made it a point to personally deal with problems in the business. As she said, I can fire a person and they'll end up hugging me. Dozens of teachers were trained by the NEV and many others taught in her studio over the years. She became a pillar in the community. 
Uh, Vonnie Marie and Deneuve, this is Vonnie Marie on the left, and uh, that's Phyllis Deneuve last year, um, formed a sort of proto-feminist bond as they worked together in multiple studios. For over 30 years, they moved together to studios, and finally into Deneuve's own studio, Atlanta Dance. Marie and Deneuve taught, marketed, managed, scheduled, dealt with finances, and counseled together to carve out a space in Atlanta's somewhat crowded Baldwin Dance studio, uh, studio arena. Uh, these close and long relationships of women working together professionally demonstrates that women actively sought to assert themselves prominently and permanently in the Atlanta ballroom industry. Um, the issue of race forms a larger part of my paper. I can't get into it right now because uh, there's no time. Oh, I didn't. Where is it going? Down here. Uh, other than to say the only reference that I found uh, in the African-American newspaper, the black newspaper in Atlanta, the Atlanta Daily World. Actually, I've only found one advert with no, there's no graphic to it just saying, hey, we're opening. Uh, but the only article is about these two black women, Mrs. M.T. Smith and Mrs. F.L. Smith, who go to a conference. In other words, they've been to a conference, they've, they've been credentialed to teach Baldwin Dawn's teachers. That's, that's, and essentially it's an advert, but it's an article by the paper saying, hey, you can go to this studio at the end. So I discuss race much more in the actual dissertation, right? Uh, while women dominated dance teaching in Atlanta in the 1920s through 50s, the number of male teachers in Atlanta was much greater than the number of female teachers in the 60s through 80s. Uh, with the onset of a full economy in the 1950s, businessmen came to studios to learn to dance, to meet accepted social norms and expectations. By the 60s, the wives of successful businessmen were looking for ways to spend their husband's money, and perhaps find attention that their busy spouses could not give them. Ballroom dance was one way that met this need. All the teachers interviewed for this project pointed out that clientele was dominated by women from the late 1960s onward. The majority of female clients were older, generally in their 60s or 70s. Female clients thus became the financial backers of Atlanta Studios. Um, some of them, I, there's more, but I'm running out of time. Some of them were widows who had their husband's money to spend. Others were successful businesswomen in their own right, but they came um, and spent time. Now, in the Bowling <laughs> Studios, women found men teachers who paid them inordinate amounts of attention. Teachers taught them on the dance floor but took an active interest in their personal lives. Some women bought lifetime contracts which entitled them to a certain number of lessons per week plus entry to all parties. Teachers tell of how some women used those lessons to sit and talk to their instructors rather than actually dance. Often born teachers paid more attention to and spent more time with women than their own families. Hence these clients forged close bonds with their male teachers and some even considered their teachers their own sons. A, ma a major argument in my um, dissertation is that Atlanta Studios, and nationally as well, in the 60s through 80s, attempted to create what I call familyness. They tried to create this environment where people felt at home and they wanted to spend time there and thus spend money in the studios, right? These women brought extra services. They went on the cruise, they went the cruises, they went out on nights on the town and to tea dances and everything else that they paid for and paid for their instructors to be there as well. They were valuable clients. Numerous teachers point out that Atlanta Studios were profitable because of these wealthy female clients. The average client who walked in off the street allowed the studio to pay the bills, but it was elite women who bought packages and studio extras that allowed the studios to thrive. So despite rhetoric that framed men as leaders and women as followers, women carved out a prominent space for themselves uh, in the ball and dance industry in Atlanta between 1950 and 1990. While studio advertising invited men to come and lead on the dance floor, the teachers who taught men were most often women in studios managed by women and sometimes owned by women. The patronage of wealthy women allowed male teachers to earn a livelihood and become more cosmopolitan through travel and exposure to elite society. Even as male teachers outnumbered female teachers in the 70s and 80s, it was women who enabled studios to remain economically viable. Women turned the generally accepted image of ballroom dance on its head. Women <coughs> led and men followed.